Welcome everyone. This is the third lightning talk session in this workshop. Later on, we will have, we will directly continue to the fourth lightning talk session. Uh, and the first lightning talk in this session will be by Alon Brutskus from Tel Aviv University with a very uh, intriguing uh, title on his uh, work. Why do overparameterized CNNs outperform overparameterized FCNs? So this is of course, one of a very interesting questions. So Alon, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, I guess I uh, said that I can start. Okay, so uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and this is a joint work with uh, my advisor, Amir Globerson. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear. So, um, so as, as you as you all know, overparameterized convolutional neural networks work very well in practice. However, we don't understand why why uh, they have good generalization uh, performance on computer vision tests, and also we don't understand why they out outperform fully connected networks. So we want to understand that. Of course, it's a very uh, difficult problem. So we uh, we focus on a very uh, simplified distribution. To consider a very simple distribution and a three layer overparameterized convolutional network, we prove, we prove that a layer wise uh, gradient descent converges to zero training error and has sample complexity of O of D, where D is the filter dimension. So this is a good guarantee for an overparameterized network. We prove that a VC dimension, that the VC dimension of the CNNs in our setting is exponential in D. So in principle, the network can overfit. And we also prove a generalization bound for a fully connected network that is O of uh, D to the two R, where R is at least one. So we see here a gap in the guarantees for CNNs versus FCNs, which, is that, which suggests that uh, the convolutional network should perform better on our task. And we indeed uh, empirically verify that convolutional network outperform fully connected networks in our setting. Okay, so what is our setting? So we consider a, a distribution on uh, images where images contain patches that are mutually orthogonal. And uh, each class has a discriminative pattern which appears in each image of the class and all other patterns in the image are spurious. So there are two desirable properties of this dis distribution. It, it defines a pattern detection problem which is similar to image, image classification tasks. And the pixels are correlated as in real image data, which is um, different from, uh, for example, Gaussian assumptions in other works. Okay, so this is an example, an illustration. We have the positive class, we have the negative class. The positive class has the positive pattern, all other patterns are spurious, and the same for the negative class. And so assume that we, we have this distribution, you can generate this uh, distribution, and that we try to learn it with, uh, with a three layer convolutional network with a convolutional layer with ReLU, max pooling, and the fully connected network. And hitting points, SGD gets zero test there. And the question is why? What we show, what we prove is that a layer wise gradient descent converges to a solution with zero training error and has sample complexity of O of D. And how do we show that? We analyze the dynamics of the first layer and we show that the, the first layer dynamics, they induce a, a representation such that first, the, there is a large number of discriminative features in the, in the representation before the fully connected layer with large absolute values. There is a large number of discriminative features with large absolute values. On the other hand, all other features have bounded absolute values. So this means that the representation can be separated with a low norm classifier. And because we know that if we train the, the, the last fully connected layer, it converges to a, a, the min norm solution, we get the good generalization guarantees via margin bound. Okay, so this is how we prove this. And for fully connected networks, we show that uh, one hidden layer over parameterized a fully connected network has a sample complexity of O of uh, D to the two R, where R is at least one. One minute left. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, and how do we show this? We apply a recent generalization bound of ours in uh, 2018 and uh, for, for over-parameterized fully connected network. And this bound is, uh, is similar to SVM bound, the max margin SVM bound. So we apply this bound and we also show, we, we analyze the, the max margin of this uh, distribution and we show this guarantee. And so this, the, all of our results suggest that a convolutional neural network should generalize better than fully connected networks in our setting and also better than SVM. And we did verify this for uh, linearly separable data, for nonlinear separable data, and for MNIST. We show in all cases that convolutional network uh, significant, significantly outperforms um, both um, fully connected networks and SVM. That's it. Thank you. Okay, exactly five minutes. Impressive, very yeah. impressive. <laughs> okay, so now it means that we have uh, less than two minutes for questions. Are there any questions from the audience? You can ask, there are 90 seconds to ask questions. Okay, so uh, I will ask the, 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 the image model that you that you're using, like the patches, that the patches are mutually orthogonal. Yeah. Did you propose this model? Is this a well-known model, a widely used model in, yeah. in theoretical analysis? So yeah. We 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 propose it. Okay, the... interesting. So and patches should be can they be overlapping or not? How does yeah. it interact? Yeah. Yeah, so the our, our some we consider, I didn't say that, we consider a non of, uh, convolutional layer with non-overlapping filters. It's for simplicity. Uh, analyzing overlapping filters is uh, much more difficult. Uh, um, personally, I, I believe that it's, uh, empirically, it should work uh, the same. But we didn't prove it. So the, image, the images that can be generated based on this model are very similar to the examples that you showed us in the in one of your slides yeah so that was just uh, one illustration of uh, i think 16 patches of uh, of, uh, of nine over nine but it can be any 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 dimension okay and any number of patterns in an image it's, okay uh, this is very interesting because we need such models in order to perform analytical research so so this is very good in my opinion so thank you very much. Thank you, Alon. And now we will proceed to the next lightning talk, which will be by Antonio Ribeiro from Uppsala University. And his title, in the title of his lightning talk is Overparameterized Regression Under L2 Adversarial Attacks. So Antonio, can you share your what? screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just shared. Can you see it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so, so you also have a... The same five minutes plus two minutes. Questions? Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. And this is joint work with uh, Thomas Kroll, my supervisor. And so I will talk about uh, about uh, what happens in linear overparameterized linear regression when you have L2 adversarial attacks. So uh, it. Uh, so it has been established over the past few years that overparameterized models can generalize effectively when you train and the train and test come from the same distribution. And the question we try to answer here is what happens when there is a distribution no shift? And uh, in order to study that, we turn to adversarial attacks. So it's a popular topic to, uh, of study in uh, neural networks. And the basic idea is that you have a model and you have an input and you, uh, you choose a worst case scenario uh, disturbance that generates a wrong prediction and very often a very uh, confident wrong prediction. And so this is set up that we work here is that we consider that uh, there is a linear model. So we are considered a linear regression setting and for the underparameterized case, we just minimize least squares. And for the overparameterized case, uh, we consider the minimal L2 norm solution. Yes. And 
So uh, we will work both with the standard risk and with the adversarial risk. So we are working with quadrat quadratic uh, error. So the error between what you predict and what you observe uh, raised to the square. And you can see for the adversarial case, you have a delta x that is a disturbance. And for now, we are considering uh, a more general case, slightly more general case, where we, you have uh, you can consider any p norm. So you are bounding this. Uh, you are finding the worst case and like the what's the worst disturbance. And in both cases, we are considering the the, expect, uh, the expectation and considering that we have the training inputs are fixed. And for this case, uh, we can actually find uh, both lower and upper bounds to the adversarial risk. So this depends on the risk. It depends on this end key that's, uh, that's basically the expectation of the, the Q norm of the estimated parameter uh, to the square. And this, uh, this Q here is just what appears from the holder inequality. So one over Q plus one over P is equal to one. And uh, this is the adversarial dis uh, disturbance magnitude. And so what's interesting for the L2 norm case is that we know all the asymptotic for all these quantities. And here we show two different cases considering like if, how, if the features are uncorrelated or if they have some correlation uh, in some explicit uh, way. And we have here the, so we have the data points and we show this asymptotic lower and upper bound and they are very, uh, close. And so we are using this, the, the syntax are mostly, most of the machinery is from this paper from Hasty and Montanari and uh, Jose and Tibishian. And I, these results, I, I find they are quite interesting because they show a very clear double descent for the adversarial risk. And this doesn't uh, match my expectation if uh, uh, we, I consider the L infinity norm because for the L infinity norm, I think maybe this uh, this type of robustness may be at odds with accuracy is a very good example. They they have a very, I think they have a toy example where they show that for the L infinity norm, as you increase the number of features, you can have you can make your uh, adversarial performance as bad as you want. And I think it's very interesting that for the L L2 norm, this is not what happens. And I think this is an indication that for different LP adversarial attacks, you can have something that behaves qualitatively different as you uh, you go to the parameterization regime. And- 30 seconds left. <laughs> and, and this is very much, uh, work in progress. So we are now working on generalizing this to the other uh, norms and getting bounds there. And so we, we are working on uh, publication. Uh, yeah, I, any questions here or, or via email would be very welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are also right on time, five minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, there is a question from Lorenzo who will also present here later on. So Lorenzo, you can ask it by yourself. Hey, uh, yeah, good talk. Uh, I had a, had a question on your previous slide. Yes. Uh, um, but so you said that for the L infinity adversarial attacks, um, performance can degrade like as much as you want or, or like, is there some limit to it? Uh, so um, actually like what happens is that like, since the, for the L infinity norm, you can disturb a little bit the, of course it's like, you can find examples where you can make this grows with the number of features. So, so since you have like, uh, you, can just, you can add a modification to each of your features and your features, uh, as you increase the number of features, you can expect them to become less and less, maybe uh, smaller in magnitude. So if you want to keep the norm of the parameter, like what happens is that if you, are giving freedom to change each one of your features a little bit, you can easily uh, get something that uh, increases with, have like something that asymptotically increases with the number of features. And so it's very easy to have something that, uh, yeah, you would not be able to observe this kind of example. 
what what I have been working on it's basically showing that it actually grows with uh, the square root of the number of features in the setup that I uh, I still is still kind of work in progress, but yeah, but uh, I think the intuition would be that it it grows with the number of features if you consider uh, L infinity adversarial attacks. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I also have a quick question because we don't have much. We have about 10 seconds left. Uh, did you try to do the same analysis for non-asymptotic settings? Because your analysis uh, is in asymptotic setting, yeah. Uh, no, not yet. I'm still like trying to, uh, yeah, trying to uh, work around that. But yeah, the, the initial results I have so far are for uh, considering asymptotic settings and mm -hmm. kind of this random matrix theory results and I think it's great that you showed how you can take analysis for a fundamental setting like like the AST et al paper and extend it to some another learning setting. So I think it's great and it's a promising uh, research direction. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, our next lightning talk is by Spencer Frey from UCLA. Spencer, are you here? Yeah, great. Uh, the title of his talk is Provable Generalization of SGD Trained Neural Networks of Any Width in the Presence of Adversarial Label Noise. Spencer, the stage is yours, thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is joint work with Yuan Kao and Chuan Chuan Gu from the UCLA CS department. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Uh, so the two kind of questions that my work touches upon are why can overparameterized neural networks generalize when trained on noisy data? Um, and why and how is it that SGD is able to succeed in even minimizing just the training error uh, when the problem is non-convex. So kind of overview of the results is that we show that a two-layer SGD trained neural network will can learn half spaces in the adversarial label noise setting, which is equivalent to the agnostic uh, setting with distribution assumptions. Um, so there's, uh, what this means is that SGD trained neural networks will always at least be competitive with the best linear classifier over the distribution. And our results will hold for any initialization of the first layer weights and width. And so we don't rely upon uh, neural tangent kernel or mean field approximations to derive these results. <clears throat> so just uh, to kind of give some more background, right? So uh, adversarial label noise, you can think it's not, it's not the same thing as adversarial examples. It's really more, um, a term from the learning theory community to mean that you imagine you have some half space V um, that determines labels. And then we have some corruption process where the labels can be flipped with the possibly instance dependent probability that can be between zero and one. So deterministic flips are allowed. Um, and the average of that corruption probability is this opt lin, which is the smallest classification error that can be achieved by a half space. Um, and so what we will show is that SGD trained networks uh, have classification error that's at most a constant times this opt lin to a power beta, where beta is uh, either one half or one, depending upon the distribution. Um, and just an aside, um, no polynomial time algorithm can learn up to a constant times opt lin without making distributional assumptions. So having assumptions on the distribution are necessary to show this type of result. Um, Okay, so the model that we consider is a one hidden layer leaky ReLU network. Um, we allow for the first layer weights to be initialized arbitrarily. Um, and we're just going to optimize over the first layer weights and keep the second layer weights randomly initialized and fix at their initialization. And so our result uh, is, is shown here, which basically we just say we have a constant learning rate. Um, then for any width uh, neural network and any initialization, uh, by running online SGD for a polynomial number of iterations, some point in the SGD trajectory, there will be uh, some weights that are found that are uh, have classification error that's at most this constant times offline to the beta. Um, where beta is going to be one for what we call uh, hard margin distributions, and beta is one half for log concave isotropic distributions uh, like the Gaussian. And so just something to note here is that the sample complexity T does not depend on the width M here. Um, and so basically no matter, and everything here holds for a neural network with what, with width with, with one versus with a uh, hundred or a thousand. Um, and so it's possible that a neural network can generalize better than a linear model eventually. Um, but you know, the, under the conditions that we have, um, if we want something to hold for any width neural network, then the best we can really hope for is a linear model 
Um, but what this just says is that in the worst case, a neural network will always generalize uh, at least competitive with what the best linear classifier does. Um, so in a word, it just means neural networks are weak learners whenever half spaces are. Um, and so just a quickly uh, high level proof ideas. It's a kind of perceptron based proof, um, which has been used by other authors like uh, Brutskis and Gloverson who have spoken today and are speaking later today. Um, and then also the introduction of this surrogate loss. Um, and the high level idea is that we look at the correlation between the weights found by SGD and the weights of uh, matrix V consisting of different scaled versions of that best linear predictor over the distribution. Uh, and we show that this correlation is going to continuously increase until we reach a point where this surrogate loss is going to be small. Um, so using Cauchy-Schwartz, this correlation is always going to be bounded by one. Um, so it can only, that correlation can only increase for a certain number of iterations until this kind of a condition fails, which means that eventually the surrogate loss will be bounded by this order off lens of beta. Um, so just to kind of uh, conclude from this, uh, it's just that this is the first algorithmic results for the generalization of neural networks in the presence of adversarial label noise. Um, but something that I'm interested in showing is whether or not, uh, you know, there are nonlinear data distributions where SGD trained networks will provably generalize. Um, and so in order for this to happen, you know, we need to consider networks that have width greater than one, um, because otherwise the hypothesis space is just going to be linear. Um, but I'm particularly interested in looking at this for neural networks with constant width, where you can't use these kind of neural tangent kernel and mean field approximations. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Also, five minutes. Excellent. Okay, there is a question by Gavin Brown. Okay, uh, I can let you ask by yourself. So, yeah. Okay, Gavin, you can you can speak and ask. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank, thanks for the talk. I was just wondering, you mentioned the, uh, the lower bounds on like an, for efficient algorithms without distributional assumptions. Um, what are the distributions that show up there and how different are they from what you're considering? Uh, so I actually, I am, I'm not familiar with the exact lower bounds that are, that are shown uh, there. So there's one lower bound that has been shown, um, even there, there are lower bounds even for Gaussian marginals um, for certain approaches. Uh, so for instance, if you have a neural network with width one, um, so it's like a logistic regression kind of setting, um, then basically there's a lower bound on Gaussian marginals that says that the minimizer of the convex surrogate will have a classification error that's optlin times log one over optlin. Um, so basically it's saying that it, any minimizer of a convex surrogate um, for the zero one loss will have error that's greater than uh, you know this this upper bound that that's been shown been shown there, um, and that's so that's on Gaussian marginals, which uh, for in my setting that's beta is one half, um, so my upper bound does not contradict that lower bound. Um, but yeah, I'm I can't recall the exact distribution used in Danieli, um, but there are lower bounds even on Gaussian marginals. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Spencer. Great talk. Uh, okay, so now we'll proceed to our next lightning talk, which is given by Yao Dong Yu from Berkeley. Yeah, hi, Yao Dong. Uh, the title is Understanding Generalization in Adversarial Training via the Bias Variance Decomposition. So it should be great. The stage is yours. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Zidong, Jacob E from UC Berkeley, and Edgar from uh, UPenn. So I will first uh, briefly uh, introduce the setup for the adversarial training. Uh, so here, uh, this is set up from uh, Madrid et al. And uh, which is widely used for training some robust classifiers. So here, uh, instead of training directly on xi and yi, we consider some worst case perturbation delta i, which is uh, in some constraint, you really consider some LP norm. And in this work, we mainly consider our infinity and our two. So here uh, we found a maximize, maximize over delta i to found a worst case perturbation. And then we minimize uh, over the model parameter C. This theta can be some linear model or some deep neural nets. So uh, a commonly observed phenomenon uh, in our search training 
is that if we perform adversarial training with some non non active or larger than zero epsilon then it will increase the generalization error where the generalization error is measured on the unperturbed inputs which is some clean samples so just to clarify our setting is perform adversarial training by varying different epsilons but we evaluate on unperturbed inputs not the perturbed inputs so this phenomenon can be captured in the following figure where the x-axis is the perturbation radius epsilon and the generalization the y-axis is the generalization error and the green dotted line is the generalization error for standard training uh, the commonly observed phenomenon is that if we increase the perturbation radius so the epsilon as the epsilon increases the generalization error will increase so that's the uh that's the phenomenon observed in practice so our main uh, uh focus of this work is trying to uh understand better what's the uh, what's the bias variance behavior of this uh under this adversarial training regime which is we perform two measurements instead of just looking at the test error we measure the bias and variance uh, with regarding to uh, the perturbation radius when we increase the perturbation. So uh, next, we will uh, briefly introduce how we evaluate the bias and variance. So the recall that the risk can be decomposed into bias square and variance for the mean square error. And uh, we are taking expectation uh, with respect to the randomness in the training data set D. And uh, we can see that the, apps, uh, the, del, uh, the theta, which is the parameter for the model, is depending on the training data set D. So uh, more concretely uh, is that we first split the data into two parts. And we train adversarially train two models on this uh, two, uh, two data sets separately and found theta d1 and theta d2. Then we use an unbiased estimator of uh, the variance to estimate the, uh, the, the variance of these two models. Uh, then we got uh, estimate our bias term by subtract, uh, subtracting the variance from the risk. So that's the overall like uh, estimation of the bias and variance, uh, which is based on our previous work. So uh, then I will present some empirical results in our work. So basically, uh, we observe the monotonally increasing risk with respect to uh, the training adversary training epsilon. And we found that the bias is monotonally increasing and the variance is first increased and then decreased, which is the unit model uh, variance curve. And, one minute, uh, one the, minute left, thanks. Thank you. So the adversary training, uh, say there's a robust interpolation threshold, which is defined that the error, robust error is uh, first time larger than uh, 2%. And the peak is around the uh, robust interpolation threshold. And then what we do is uh, the main three main phenomenon is the variance peak versus the interpolation threshold, the bias dominant the risk, and uh, there's a monotonally increasing bias plus unimodal variance. So we also did some robust check in different settings, say R2, R infinity on C for 10 C for 100. Uh, also, we did a uh, bias variance decomposition for the crossing to be loss. And we also uh, do a sanity check on the linear uh, logistic regression uh, using adversarial training. We also observe this unimodal uh, variance curve. And in the end, we present our conjecture uh, in this uh, bias variance framework is that if we perturb our model, either increase the regularization, increase the width, uh, width of the model, or adding adversarial perturbation, if there is an interpolation threshold, then uh, in the variance, um, the, the conjecture is that the, the variance will change the monotonicity around the interpolation threshold. So to highlight that, uh, this is also true for, uh, also empirically observed in the standard training, uh, uh, under label corruption, that uh, the peak is also around the interpolation stress. So that's all. Thank you. And uh, any questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Eldon.
Uh, are there any questions? We have one minute for questions because we are uh, six minutes uh, from the beginning. Questions? Okay. So we actually had three lightning talks in a row about adversarial training. So can you further emphasize the differences, like something that you didn't prepare in your uh, in your presentation, like from, from the beginning that you didn't see in the previous two two lightning talks? Uh, you mean the our two adversarial training the the precise uh, curves on that? I think uh, it, I think previous one is a uh, standard training, but evaluated on uh, under adversarial perturbations. But here we are evaluating uh, like on clean data, but using adversarial training. And uh, our work is more like an empirical like measurement. So uh, we don't have uh, precise uh, descriptions of the curves. Uh, we only evaluate those uh, bias reference terms. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next lightning talk is by Lorenzo Luzzi from Rice University. Is the title of his talk is Overparameterized Linear Subspace uh, and Generative Adversarial Networks. The, the Effects of Supervision and Autonormality Constraints. Okay, Lorenzo, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Just enlarge it to the full screen. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, so. In this work, I'm going to talk about uh, dimensionality reduction and GANs. And uh, we define this term called rank core parameterization, which I'll get into it in a little bit. And um, we, we construct a plane of learning problems where each problem has different levels of supervision and orthonormality constraints on the solution. And we provide uh, an algorithm to solve these learning problems. And finally, we show when double descent emerges on this supervision orthonormality plane. So to begin, uh, let's talk about dimensionality reduction. So we start with vectors in RD and we subsample their coordinates to get vectors in RP. Uh, and this allows us to control the level of parameterization in our model. Then we do dimensionality reduction on uh, this RP space to get vectors in RK. Uh, and we learn this mapping with uh, by minimizing a unsupervised loss with orthonormal constraints. So for example, uh, in this setting here, D is 130. So here on the y-axis, we have uh, our subsampling P. So down here, this would mean that we take one coordinate of the original vector. And up here means we would take all of the coordinates. And uh, we have 70 data points. So that means everything above this black line is overparameterized because we have more features than uh, samples. Um, and the x-axis is k, which is our learned subspace, which by definition has to be smaller than uh, p. So that's why this part's undefined. Um, and so we define rank overparameterization as when both p and k are greater than n. So it's when we're in this region to the right of the red dash line. Um, and it's it's kind of different than just normal reparameterization because not only do we have more features than data, but we're also learning a subspace that is of higher dimension than the number of data points. Uh, and this can be solved using PCA and uh, there's no double descent. Um, so in this setting I just gave you, we're unsupervised and uh, we have orthonormal constraints. Uh, however, uh, regression is supervised and has no constraints on W, but we get double descent, right? So uh, can we do something in between? And we can. So we construct this plane here um, where in the top left corner, we essentially have PCA, right? Where we have orthonormal constraints and it's unsupervised. And in the bottom right hand corner, we have regression, which is fully supervised and no constraints. And uh, any point here in this plane, I guess, uh, is a learning problem with some level of supervision and some level of constraints on your load matrix. Um, and to solve these problems, we provide a projected gradient descent algorithm. And we see that as we go from up here, top left to the bottom right, uh, double descent emerges. 
So to give you some specific examples, um, if we're in the fully supervised setting and we just change orthonormality constraints, um, this bottom line here is uh, with orthonormal constraints. And as we go up, we reduce this constraint and we get a larger and larger peak for, um, for solutions. Um, and then if we go diagonally uh, from you know, PCA to regression, we get this guy. Um, at first, when we're near the, the beginning, we get these dotted lines in the background. So there's no double descent. But then after a certain amount of supervision or formality constraints, we actually do get a uh, double descent. So how does this relate to GANs? Uh, so it's a little different because we have to reverse the situation. One we're, not, we're mapping uh, low dimensional vectors to high dimensional vectors. And uh, we know that GANs, linear GANs are related to PCA and we actually use linear GANs in this work, um, but it, the, we can't just apply our previous results because things are technically a little different. Uh, for example, we have to subsample Z, uh, the latent variable now instead of X. Um, and another thing is the rank uh, over parameterization coincides with normal over parameterization in this setting. Um, but the supervision orthonormality plane is still relevant here. And so uh, this figure here is uh, in the fully supervised case. Uh, but we're changing the level of orthogonality constraints and we get double descent just as before. So actually this behavior is very similar to the, uh, the previous thing. And we do get double descent as we increase supervision and decrease orthogonality constraints. So in conclusion, uh, we discussed this rank over parameterization and we construct this supervision orthogonality plane of subspace learning problems and provide an algorithm to solve these problems. And uh, what we get from that is the double descent emerges as the problems become more supervised and less constrained. And this is true for both dimensionality reduction and GANs. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Lorenzo. Uh, I think we have a question from uh, Jerry. Jerry, can you ask? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, orthogonality, uh, orthonormality is one of the constraints you could have imposed on this. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if you enforce something else, for example, some small norm, uh, whether you can construct a similar plane and whether you would observe a similar phenomena. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can definitely, con you can definitely impose other constraints. Um, and uh, the reason why we picked orthonormality is because for PCA, uh, that's, you know, it's usually uh, what people assume. And so uh, it's a, I guess, nice uh, transition from PCA to regression, but you can definitely, definitely use other things. Actually, the way that we implemented the autonormality constraints at various levels is by limiting the singular values of the solution matrix to be in a specific width around, around zero. So this essentially reflects the level of autonormality because if all, all of them are ones, then you have strict autonormality. And as you deviate from it, you have a lower and lower level of autonormality. So it, it is related to your question about the norm, if they are related to the singular values of the metrics. Awesome, thank you both. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Lorenzo. Uh, now we will proceed to the next lightning talk. The next lightning talk is by Jia Cheng Zhu from the University of Texas at Austin. And the title of his talk is on the computational and statistical complexity of over-parameterized metric sensing. Hi, uh, I'm wondering if my screen is shared correctly? Y yes, it seems so. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, hi, uh, this is Jiacheng. Today we're going to talk about on the, computational on the computational and statistical complexity of over-parameterized metric sensing. Uh, this, is a joint, this is a joint work with John Yo, Nat, and Constantine from UT Austin. For the matrix sensing problem, the setup is like this. We have a ground truth matrix X star, which is PSD of rank R, and we have sensing matrices AI, whose entries are IID sub Gaussian. The response YI is just the matrix stock product of this two plus the sub Gaussian noise. Given an IID observation of YI and AI, uh, we want to estimate X star. Besides the typical convex relaxation approach, we can also capture this PSD and rank constrained by factorization by introducing FF transpose as the variable X 
as long as f is of dimension d by k, we know that ff transpose is of, of at most rank k. This problem is usually referred to as the factorized matrix sensing problem. Given this factorized form, we can just solve it using gradient descent method. Although this is non-convex for f, we, we still observe great success empirically, and recently we are able to establish convergence guarantee under suitable uh, conditions. But the challenge here is that what if the specified rank, which is k, is larger than a true rank r, and especially if k probably is even smaller than d. Uh, so under this setting, we want to know what is the achievable statistical error and how fast can we actually recover the target matrix x star. Why we want to study this problem? Well, first of all, uh, in, uh, in application, the true rank r is not always known, and, and we want to guess the rank. And to guess the rank, we really want to overguess the rank. Uh, in fact, overspecified rank will change the convergence behavior dramatically. As in this simulation, we perform matrix sensing, uh, where the ground truth rank x star is of rank r is of rank three. When we specify the rank to be three, we know, we see that uh, the gradient descent converges linearly up to machine uh, up to machine precision. But as we uh, specify the rank to be four, which is only one larger than the ground truth rank, we only have sublinear convergence. If we zoom in a little bit, we actually see that we first have linear convergence up to some point and then have sublinear convergence. This phenomenon is actually not captured by all existing work and we want, and we want to uh, dive, deep, dive, deep, dive deep into this. Uh, lastly, this, this problem is actually uh, connected to the implicit regularization phenomenon that has uh, recently get a lot of interest uh, and we think that having a thorough and simple understanding of the statistical aspect of this problem would be a good foundation and a good starting point for anything else. The main challenge here is really just we are now tackling a degenerate Hessian and given degenerate Hessian, most statistical analysis would be very difficult and all of the existing work does not apply in this case. The main idea for us to solve this problem is we look at the strongly convex part and the non strongly convex part separately. By doing so, we introduce the we introduce the eigen decomposition for x star, and we decompose x star into u space and v space, where u space is the strong signal part or strongly convex part, and v space is the uh, non strongly convex part. Since we assume x star to be rank r, we can think about dt being very 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 small. Since we also assume u and v of uh, u space and v space are perpendicular to each other. So for any ft, uh, we can decompose f into u space and v space. So given this notation, we know we now know that as long as s s transpose converges to d s and t t transpose converges to d t, s t transpose converges to zero, we know that f f transpose will converge to x star. So now we decompose this problem into three into three separate parts. The main result of, or the main theorem of our work is given sort of assumptions. One, uh, when a X star is approximately low, approximately low rank, uh, we have good initialization up to sigma r. We have ample amount of samples where sample complexity scale with kd log d and appropriate step size. We know that the sequence that we generated by gradient descent method will first converge linearly for the strong signal part will first converge linearly up to some point. And then overall, we will converge sublinearly uh, up to your statistical error. A few remarks before the end of this, uh, uh, before the end is, sure, sure. Uh, a few remarks before the end is that the progress made by the strongly convex part uh, is linear in the beginning uh, before it actually hit, hit it or by hindered by the sublinear progress of the non-strongly convex part. Actually, similar observation play a very important role in recent understanding of implicit regularization, uh, for example, as in a work by Yuan Ji Li at all 2018. Also, uh, in a, by, our, by, by our analysis, the, st the statistical error is minimax optimal up to log factor, and therefore over parameterization in this case only compromise the convergence rate, but not the statistical rate. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Um, okay, thank you very much, Jess Yang. Uh, are there any questions? We have uh, 90 seconds for questions. Questions? Okay. So, yeah, so, so essentially you also study 
some kind of rank over parameterization or some kind of rank properties in over parameters models, right? Sorry, can you repeat your question? So essentially there is also in your work, there is also some aspect of, of rank over parameterization of, of some over parameterized models that are affected by the rank, like, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so it's interesting because in the previous lightning talk, there were, these were a linear subspaces, which is like the simplest case to consider rank and so on. And, and your case is, is, is a bit more intricate. So, but, but all of these, I think they have some, some shared theme. So this is very interesting. And I think there is a lot to, to, to research on these topics. Uh, quick question. Sure. No. Okay. So yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. We will Thanks. proceed to the next lightning talk. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. The next lightning talk is by Jeremiah Sulan from Johns Hopkins University. And the title of his talk is Recovery and Generalization in Overrealized Dictionary Learning. Thank you so much, Yuda. It's, it's really great to be here in this amazing workshop and, and tell you a bit about this work, which is joined with Chong Yu, who is now at, uh, sorry, this is Berkeley, but he's now at Google, um, and Simu Tu from the University of Denver. So we are looking at an unsupervised problem um, in, in dictionary learning, and I'm going to be talking about the not as my grand truth model, which will have P not um, columns in D dimensions, and P not is going to be greater than D, so this is a general over complete setting. The data, uh, we're going to sample sparse vectors, uh, simply just k sparse vectors, the non zeros are just going to be drawn from a normal. And our data is going to be given by this linear forward model. And I'm going to have n training samples. Now, in learning dictionaries, uh, what I want to do is find a dictionary that minimizes some loss. In this case, the loss is going to be given by this, which basically asks how good can my dictionaries pass code um, a, a given input data x. And G here can be your favorite uh, sparsely promoting prior, could be an L0 um, pseudonorm or an L1 relaxation. And in the end of the day, we're trying to find a dictionary that minimizes our loss in expectation over the distribution, but we only have N training samples, and so we minimize this empirical risk instead. Now, this empirical risk minimization problem is a very complicated optimization problem. Um, the good news is that in terms of, you know, practical algorithms, there's a whole variety of, of options that we can pick and they work really well in practice. Uh, theoretically, there have been a, a series of very interesting, but at the same time limited results in terms of when we can expect these very non, uh, very non convex problem to be solved to optimality. So the question that we ask in this work is, you know, all of these dictionary learning algorithms search for dictionaries in the same model class as the generating dictionary that gave you your data. And why should you do that? Why shouldn't you perhaps look for larger dictionaries? And, and here's a motivating example. I constructed a grand truth dictionary with 70 columns. Uh, so P naught is 70. And I'm going to search for dictionaries with increasing size, P prime. Now, if you look at the risk, well, the risk decreases initially and then increases. And if you work on statistical learning, then this is not, not surprising at all. But if you work in optimization, this is surprising because even at P0, there exists a model that achieves zero risk, right? Now, perhaps more surprisingly, the recovery error, so how good you're doing in actually recovering your, your grand truth model also improves for some interval of P prime. Now, you, you, are, you may be asking, how am I measuring recovery error or how, how am I measuring this distance between uh, matrices of different sizes? Well, we have this generalized notion of distance. Uh, it's not really a distance, but it is zero if and only if you recover each and every atom in the ground truth uh, model. In fact, this behavior uh, improves as you train with more and more data. Um, we were not the only ones to be sort of surprised by this and, and, and to, to report these, uh, these phenomena. Uh, Sanjay Das Gupta over a decade ago showed something similar for k-means and more recently the group of David Sontag also uh, basically showed case empirically that this is true for a series of latent variable models. So our end result is basically to characterize this phenomenon in the specific setting of dictionary learning. And what we can show is that the recovery error, so how good you're doing in recovering your one truth model, is upper bounded by something that is like your training error. It's not exactly this, and, and I can't, I don't have time to go into the details, but it's something that you can measure. 
and the generalization gap. And this basically portrays a picture that I showed you before because you can obtain lower training error by over parameterizing or using over realized dictionaries by increasing the degrees of freedom of your model. And you can keep the recovery error small as long as you increase your training samples accordingly to compensate for the increased complexity of your model as measured here by P prime. Um, we also answered One the following minute. question. Thank you, Yuda. Uh, there's a follow-up question, which is, well, now you obtained a better dictionary, better estimate for your atoms, but they are within this bigger pool P prime. Can you still recover the best P zero within that larger P prime? And it turns out that you can do it basically for free. Um, in, in red, you see the improvement in risk, uh, which is basically like an oracle computation if you had the ground truth model to compare um, distances. In blue is the one that you obtain with a practical distillation algorithm that we have, which basically recovers the best P0 atoms uh, from your larger P prime set. And in fact, that, that this distillation algorithm is probably correct and there's some uh, typical assumptions of incoherence and, 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 uh, and sparsity. Okay, so that's all I had. I just wanted to tell you that overparameterization is not only useful uh, to obtain models with potentially better risk, but also to improve recovery of latent variable models. Um, and, and specifically, I show this for dictionary learning. And of course, this opens uh, very interesting questions that we don't have answers for yet in terms of how, what, why is it that this is a case and how does the optimization landscape change as we uh, overparameterize this model? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Jared. Uh, okay, I think we have a question by Julian. Uh, okay, I will let you, I will find you in the- ah, yes. Yeah, what, what is the Julian in the next session. Okay, Julian, you can speak, thanks. Hi, uh, it was a very nice talk. I was just wondering if there's a geometric intuition behind having an over-realized uh, dictionary. How do you, uh, where are all these extra atoms going? Uh, excellent. So I have, okay, the, the, the bottom line is we don't have a complete uh, intuition over this. However, we do have some hints. And in fact, our paper shows numerics of this hint. And what happens is the moment you go into over-realized setting, in the, in the over-realized over regime, some atoms um, go to very, recover, get very, very close to your original atoms, while others get pretty far away. In fact, this is the intuition of why you can still uh, prune the, uh, the, these atoms effectively uh, in practice and in theory. So there is a separation um, that happens as you go um, into this over-realized regime. Why this happens uh, in terms of the geometry of the, of the loss function, we don't know. Thanks. Okay, I have a quick question relatively. Um, so are you interpolating your training data do you achieve zero yes. training? Okay, so, yes. so, so this is very interesting because essentially you're showing us uh, an interpolating model, which is uh, you're showing us an over parameterized model essentially, over realized, but it's a, Correct. Correct. a type of over parameterized model that achieves zero training error. And the phenomena are different and the problem is different. So this is very. This is something to think about. This is very interesting. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, th th thank you for the comment, Yuda. Yeah. Okay, so in this note, we conclude this uh, great lightning talk session. And we will have two minutes, two minutes break until the next lightning talk session that video will uh, share. So uh, thank you very much.